So welcome to the stage, the morning panel, and I shall be handing over now to my colleague from the board, Sophia Smith, who's the moderator for our morning panel, for which the title is Envisaging What Survivorship Care Should Look Like. Thank you, Sophia. Hi everyone. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's such an amazing feeling to be sitting here as a survivor and a researcher. I may be the only one wearing these two hats. Um, after decades of connecting with you all online. So I'm really jealous that Aaron got to ask a question. So I'd love to ask you all a question. So how many of you know what ACOR is? Oh my goodness. Okay. So ACOR was the first online or <clears throat> email listserv that we used to communicate back in the 90s, I asked Paul, I'm like, when did Linda's name set this up? How many of you know Linda? Okay, even a smaller number. Linda was amazing. She was our first Hodgkin's advocate. And she taught us a lot about late effects. And unfortunately, Linda is no longer on this planet, but I'm very confident that she is here in spirit today. So call out to Linda. Um, so the name of our panel today is Envisioning What Survivors Should Care Should Look Like. So um, now I'm extremely honored and privileged to introduce our stellar rock star panel. So um, we've already heard from Dr. Emily Tonner Rizos, Dr. Larissa Mekliadov and our own Aaron Cummings. So it gives me great pleasure now to introduce you to two survivors. So first is Susie Lay. And Susie received her degree in nursing from the University of Arizona in Tucson in 1969 and served as a lieutenant in the U.S. Army Nurse Corps. Seven months after completing a tour of duty in the Mekong, Mekong thank you, Delta in South Vietnam, she was diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma and treated with some of the earliest forms of chemotherapy and radiation. This experience influenced her decision to enter the newly founded field of oncology nursing and began this phase of her career working as a research nurse in the new department of Hemonc at the University of Arizona Medical Center. For the past 35 years, Susan has also focused her efforts on national advocacy work with special emphasis on the long-term and late effects of cancer treatment. Her most cherished involvement has been with the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, also known as NCCS, as a founding member and past president. That's impressive, folks. Um, she has also been actively involved with many professional organizations, including the Oncology Nursing Society and the National Cancer Institute. Susan also worked as a survivorship consultant and educator with the Arizona Oncology, a multi-site community practice in Tucson until multiple treatment-related cardiac complications made it difficult to fulfill work obligations and accelerated her decision to retire. So second, I would like to introduce Stan Barta. <laughs> oh, we have a cheering section. 
Uh, Stan Barta was diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma at age 13, 50 years ago. Are you guys tied or? 52, all right, very good. Um, five years of surgery, cobalt radiation, and MOP chemotherapy led him to complete remission, just in time for high school graduation. This was followed, me too, this was followed by 30 years of good health, travel adventures, sailing, and boat building. When Stan and his wife Kathy adopted two toddler boys from Thailand, they moved the whole family to their tug trawler, yes. where Stan became the at-home parent, homeschooling his sons aboard ship. The family had numerous maritime escapades in the coastal waters of Washington and British Columbia. Stan began to experience late effects about 10 years ago. He credits Dr. Michael Stubblefield, there you are, I see you, vigilance with preventing him from having a fatal heart attack. Stan was diagnosed with advanced radiation-induced coronary artery disease heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and cardiac cachexia. Cachexia. cachexia, thank you. You can tell I'm a social worker and not a, <laughs> not a medical clinician. Uh, Stan used to lament the things he could no longer do due to fatigue and shortness of breath. With the help of a palliative care therapist, he has turned to exploring what he can be and what his true values are. So <clears throat> there you go, rock star panel. So how this is going to work is I will be uh, posing questions to our panel. And after, <clears throat> pardon me, after my questions are posed, we're gonna open it up to your questions. And at last count, I, I received 10 questions from you all. So thank you so much. I, we've got 53 minutes, so as your moderator here, I'm gonna um, do my best to, to kind of keep us on track, and hopefully we'll be able to get to all the questions. So let's go ahead and get started. You guys ready? <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so the first question I have <clears throat> for our panel is, what are some effective ways that survivors can engage with their primary care and or oncologist? So who wants to take that one? <clears throat> well, I guess I can start. <laughs> um, I think effective ways to, uh, to engage with primary care and oncologists is to really uh, I think go in prepared. I think we really have to be prepared with our as much history as possible. And this is certainly where I would wish that we would all have access to more survivorship care plans. Yeah. If we had a survivorship care plan that really laid out all the historical information that we had, it then gives them something to go on. And I know one of the uh, survivorship care plans um, gives a lot of information at the very end of the plan as to what we can do and, and ask and find out what our risk factors are and then hopefully get them to, uh, to correspond with, uh, with what we're, we're asking. But I really like, I like my physicians to listen to what I have to say and then, you know, really go from there as to what they can offer us. But they, there's no way primary care doctors can know everything, absolutely right. no way. And so we really have to have a partnership between the oncologist, the oncology team, and primary care, and all the other ologists that we see yeah. in order to, uh, uh, to share our experience. As, especially as we age. Yes, yes. And yes. so I'm, I'm, curious, I'm curious how many of our audience has a care plan. Should we ask them? Yeah. How many of you have a survivorship care plan? Oh, that makes me sad. <laughs> but I think most, most of us who have a survivorship care plan actually probably make them ourselves. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to, to engage our physicians to be able to do that. And it really isn't fair for our oncologists to make those plans up anyway. They don't have the time. Right. Mm -hmm. So hopefully they have identified some staff person who can actually uh, uh, work on care plans for us. And those are evolving. It's not one, one so, deal at once. Th thank you, Sue. So Aaron, I'm just thinking our role on Hodgkin's International, maybe one of the things we can look at is educating our community on what a care plan is and how to yeah, I, I mean, I think we, we've we been trying to do that. We actually have our own care plan that was developed by Tess. Oh, right. um, mm -hmm. And it's unique in that it was developed by a physician who happens to be a Hodgkin survivor. Yeah. So we've had that actually for years. But care plans change, and they're not, um, they're very individualistic. Yeah. And the other problem with care plans is not everyone has a complete history of the kind of treatment they received. Mm. And that's a problem, especially for long-term yeah. survivors. So I think that we're a little bit um, yeah. lacking in that area. I mean, how do we provide that information if we don't have access to it? Most of us who are that far out don't even have our initial medical records. So it's another reason to have to be proactive. Right. It's also another reason to start from the beginning and yeah. keeping yeah. track yeah, yeah. of what you have been through. I mean, I, I advocate for survivorship and long-term effects being discussed from day one yeah. so yeah. that we don't wait until someone's 10 years out and all of a sudden is having heart issues. Right. Um, so I think that is something that we can encourage, the early onset of keeping yeah. track of what's yeah. happened to you. Thank you. Anyone else want to? Yeah. So I just wanted to say something about the, the care plan, and, and you may throw things at me um, for saying this, but um, I've actually moved away from developing a separate piece of paper um, for, um, for survivors and for their primary care physicians. And now that more and more patients have access to their electronic medical record systems um, and have access to the portals, what I do is I encourage my patients to look at the portal, look at my note, um, and my note very distinctly summarizes the treatments that the patient had, um, sort of what are their current late and, and late and long-term effects, and then kind of an, a, a, in a way sort of modeled after the diagram that I showed you, sort of the buckets of care you know, including the, the risk of recurrence and other cancers, the late and long-term effects, the psychosocial issues, um, health promotion and, and disease and chronic disease management. And so my, um, sort of my approach now is instead of, you know, a developing a standalone document that doesn't change over time, I update, right? Like, because as patients continue follow-up, they may get other cancers, right? It's not just one cancer, and so, you know, oftentimes my, you know, oncologic history has, you know, one cancer, the second cancer, the third cancer, the fourth cancer, and so there is not one single document that's going to address all of those cancers. So that is my current definition of, of, of a care plan. It's basically a care plan is a communication tool, right. mm -hmm. something that a patient right. can read, something that a primary care physician can read. You know, primary care physicians are not used to getting this other plan. They don't know, they, like, they don't know. We don't know what that is. But they're used to getting notes from specialists, and they're used to reading notes from specialists. So I think, I, 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 I believe in, in education and communication, but I think we kind of, in my view, and, and some others in literature, like we need to sort of move away from like a care plan as a piece of paper, but really as a care plan, like care planning and communication. But not everyone has access Correct. to exactly. physician like you. And so right. many no, of but our <laughs> right. no, absolutely. But I think that areas. but I think the lingo, what I meant yeah. is really yeah. like we yeah. need to move away from the lingo oh. of a oh care plan, God. but really like we need you need a treatment summary. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a survivorship care planning communication. <laughs> but and it also has to be something that we can 
take to all the different specialists right. that we see. Exactly. Yeah. And it has to be concise Correct. Mm -hmm. and easy for them to access, but it is something that evolves, just as survivorship evolves, right. mm -hmm. the care plan evolves. But Sophia, yes. can I back up yeah. and answer question number one? Just sure. from one more perspective. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking about this uh, in the last couple of years. I had not realized it until I had sat down and thought back about uh, what makes me interact with my physicians these days mm. in the way that I do. And I realized, again, this was just a couple of years ago, and mm. I'm thinking back 50 full years, it was my mother who taught me self-advocacy, and I had never noticed that until recently. And here was the scene. I, it was uh, my second surgery. They opened my side up to remove a large mediastinal mass. Um, so I was in, I was back in my hospital room. The surgeon came in each morning to check on me, see how I was doing. Um, for the first two days, he would come in. Um, he, was, he was built like me, too, but he was a former army sergeant, uh, army doctor, I think. He would come into the room, he would examine me, and he would say, mm hmm, okay. I'll see you tomorrow, and he would leave the room. My parents were there. The third morning he came in, and my mom was not going to have any more of that. My, my mom was four foot ten. She weighed over 200 pounds. He came into the, into the room that day, that third day after surgery, and I didn't notice this until a little bit later. She quietly stepped over to the door while he was examining it. She closed it. She stood in front of it <laughs> with her arms on her very ample bosom. And she just waited for him to, to do the same thing. And he did. And he turned to leave and he, he walked to her. She didn't say a word and his mouth just fell to the floor. <laughs> he wasn't sure quite what to do with that. And my mom looked him straight in the eye and she said, Dr. Jolly, and he was anything but, Dr. Jolly, you're not leaving this room until you answer every single one of my questions. Oh, yeah. Yay, mom. And yeah. was, at the time, I was mortified. I was a 13-year-old boy. I was just pulled the bed sheets over my head, I'm sure. But he, he did. He answered every single one of her questions. She had a high school education. She didn't have an enemy in the world. She loved everybody, but she, she had had enough of that. And she grilled him with sharp, intelligent questions, perfectly appropriate. And she didn't budge until he did answer them. <laughs> the next morning when he came into the room, he did his exam, and he turned around, looked straight at her, and said, Mrs. Barta, is there anything I can possibly <laughs> answer for you before I leave today? And that's the way it stayed. Thank she you. taught me to be a self Thank that's you. That's great. OK, moving along. Um, this question is mostly for Dr. Tanarisa. Uh, what is exciting you the most in the world of cancer survivorship research? And somewhat related to that, what are your thoughts on the newly released standard, standards of care? OK, thank you for those questions. <laughs> um, I did give a little preview of my answer to this question in my slides yeah. in terms of mm -hmm. what's exciting to me about survivorship research. I think not just the discoveries that are being made in diagnosing and treating cancer of all different types, but also in the way that our world has shifted in how we approach cancer treatment and survivorship, which really is a patient-oriented view you know, that the times have changed a lot, and we are acknowledging that as a research community. And I think that research on shared decision making, communication, trust, yeah. um, is a, a very exciting area, and where things are going in survivorship. It's so interesting. Okay, what was the oh, second the question? Standards of oh, the care. standards, and, yes. Okay. Uh, maybe you could give a little background yeah, on course. what those yes. are. Yes, maybe. okay, amazing. So, um, so we know that in survivorship, there is no previously published standard for what constitutes high quality survivorship mm -hmm. care. And this presents an issue, and I've observed this in places where I have worked, where it's very difficult to evaluate survivorship programs on any sort of quality metric. It's, it's a huge challenge. So for example, when I was working in the hospital, we have a quality metric which is 
what percentage of your patients are getting prophylaxis against venous thromboembolism. So every hospitalized patient is supposed to have this problem addressed in some way. And we would get a record at the end of every quarter on how well we were doing on that quality metric. There is nothing like that in survivorship where we could say, evaluate providers, evaluate programs, evaluate hospitals and organizations in the quality of care that they're providing to cancer survivors. So starting about a year ago through the cancer moonshot and led by the person who's the Office of Cancer Survivorship Deputy Director, Michelle Malika, and including a bunch of people who are here in this room, um, they held a series of meetings on developing standards of care for cancer survivors. It's called the National Standards for Cancer Survivors, and they are published on our website. We also had a paper that includes them. And then we put out a call for research to evaluate organizations to see whether this type of care is being provided to cancer survivors in the United States, and if not, what are the ways that it's falling short so that we can do a, figure out how to put organizations to task to provide high-quality survivorship care. So all of that is on our website. It um, was, it's something that happened almost honestly by accident. There are many things in the federal government where you can realize for a long time that there's a problem, but there's nobody who's looking for a solution. <laughs> and then someone comes along and says, what should we be working on? And so Michelle and I stepped up. We said, we need some quality standards. And, and so now we have those. And it will be a work in progress. Yes. You know, we'll see. And thank you for that. Yeah. That's so important. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right, Erin, you ready? Oh, <laughs> not really, but good. Go ahead, Abby. What is Hodgkin's International doing to facilitate awareness of late effects among survivors and clinicians, and in particular, and I know this is near and dear to both of our hearts, survivors who may not even know that they're at risk? My mind's blank. Um, yeah. No, it, it, that, to me, that's the, our biggest hurdle is getting to folks who don't know their risks. I mean, we're all here because we do know. Right? We're, we're the lucky ones because we know enough to find out more. My worry is that there are still so many people who have no yeah. idea. They are out of touch with their initial clinicians. They have no reason to be an oncology patient anymore. So I, I think that's, that's an issue. I feel it is not insurmountable. I really think that, you know, for Pete's sake, with AI, if we can, and, and if we can put yeah. a man on the moon, right. we can figure out how to get to people who are out of the loop. We can, I know we can. It's gonna take time and funding. Yeah. And those are two things that not everybody has. I worry that we get to people before it's too late. So I, I think as an organization, there's lots that we can do. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to ever hear that we're stuck or we can't. I don't believe that for right. a second. I think we have enough brain power to figure it out. And I hope we dedicate ourselves to making it happen, not just to take care of those who know, but of those who don't know. Exactly. And you know, the word advocacy just popped into my mind. And how do we advocate Mm -hmm. And perhaps partner with some of our sister organizations um, to bring this to the forefront in terms of the importance of this problem. Well, I actually think it, it has to go beyond Hodgkin's. Mm -hmm. And if we can work yeah. with the, the groups that are really dealing with all the other cancers, yeah. uh, the, all the, all the, the other body part cancers, yeah. um, and general organizations like NCCS, I think we just have to get the major issue out there that there are risks yeah. at, for being a long-term survivor and how do we deal with it. And I remember a lot of us have probably, uh, we probably heard about some of the potential risks by signing consent forms, but who in the world pays attention to consent forms when you're there dealing with your, your life in your hands? And so you kind of, I mean, you just go over that uh, totally. So hopefully our oncology providers can help guide us from the moment of diagnosis on and then have that continual evolving survivorship care plan <laughs> or whatever you want to call it. 
but it, that's going to evolve over, over time. But letting us know that we have potential risk factors right up front so that, I know as an oncology nurse, I would try to talk to people when they would come back maybe five years later. It would freak them out that they had some risk factors that they knew nothing at all about. So I think it's a real communication problem as to how we d deliver this kind of information that can be scary, but not make it so scary and know that we'll be there to, uh, you know, I, to I try to ameliorate have to be, those. I agree. I think it's going to have to be part of the conversation that it has to be normalized. Right. So we have right. to stop yeah. thinking about it as something that one other thing that we can't talk about it. Yeah. We have to talk about it. We have to stop worrying that we're going to frighten people. I don't know there's a person in this room who would hear that they may have heart problems 50 years down the road and say, forget it, I'm not going to do anything. Of course yeah. we would. Of course yeah. we did. We didn't even know. Our doctors didn't know about some of the late effects we are facing now. So that's all kind of immaterial. The point is to educate folks now and to make the conversation a part of cancer, period. Survivorship has its issues. It's not and not going to be, you know, rainbows and butterflies after you ring that bell. But we're going to be here with you every step of the way. And I think if we can get that message across, people will listen and it won't be such a hard thing to hear. I also have a major problem with people being told that the five-year mark is your magic cure mark. Uh, uh, be, you know, we, we, are on, we walk on eggshells for five years, and then it's like, wow, we're free. We're never going to have anything again. With them, then we start popping up some other things. 20 years and later. And when you think of five years, what does five years mean when you have all different kinds of cancers, all different stages of cancers, all different treatments, you know, all different... Everything is different, we're very individualized, so five years really can't mean that much yeah. to every survivor. So. Yeah, great point. Good. Okay, we got one more question and then I'm gonna move to the submitted questions. Uh, so this one's for our survivors, others are welcome to chime in. What do you feel is still missing in the care that you receive for your Hodgkin? Well, it, most of us have experienced this and may be experiencing it right now. It's still having, <clears throat> having a wider array of doctors aware of at least the general principles of late-term effects mm -hmm. and watching for them. Um, I've, over the years, I've moved a number of times, and so I've been involved in different hospital systems or different clinic systems and still consistently um, have run into that issue all, all across specialties except for one, and I don't understand quite why, and that is GI doctors have almost always understood as soon as I even breathe a word about my history, they know and they're asking the right questions. I don't know why that is, and my current dentist as well. Um, so, but, and I have found that consistently to be true with three or four GI doctors. There's something about their schooling or, or something that prepared them. I, uh, I, when I go in and talk to my doctors, it's really difficult finding, finding doctors, for one thing, that'll listen to you and really act as a partner with you. But uh, recently I've been dealing with cardiac issues and a whole group of of uh, medical students and residents, interns came into my room and they're all talking and, and uh, so they said, well, we have to ask you this question. You're gonna be going on your anesthesia and there's a chance that maybe you won't wake up or you'll have some kind of a problem. So what do you, what do you want done in case, in case something happens? And I looked at them and I said, as long as my brain is working, you get me back right away because I still have a lot to teach you guys <laughs> because we, real, we are the teachers to, these, to our physicians and the physician that can partner with us and really learn from us and appreciate that we know what we do about our 
healthcare history. Um, uh, then it makes all the difference in the world. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I just, yeah, I just wanted to, to comment on that and, and I think maybe also just kind of go back to the primary care uh, physician. So when you come to our survivorship program, we have an hour to see a new patient. Mm -hmm. um, but that, but in, in addition to that one hour, there is time that we dedicate to look at your medical records and pull out the relevant information, the type of cancer that you had, the type of treatment that you had. And so we kind of go into the visit already preparing for your visit, and then we have you know, a good amount of time to, to spend with you. When you go to see your primary care doctor, um, they're not gonna have the information. Um, they may have the information, but they might not have gone through the information, and they don't have an hour to spend with you. So, you know, what I, sort of speaking on, sort of wearing my other hat as a PCP, you know, the importance there is, you know, when you're coming in as a new patient, um, sort of understand th where they're coming from, right? They're, they're busy, they're being rushed, they're constantly, you know, being asked to do 15 million things that they don't really want to do. Um, like, they would rather see patients. <laughs> And so, you know, n not every problem, and, and especially, right, like a long-term Hodgkin survivor where you're gonna have so many potential medical problems and history, all of that will not be addressed in one visit, you know? And so I think I would encourage people to just kind of be patient with that and, you know, sort of address some of the questions and some of the concerns and then schedule a follow-up, you know, to see the doctor again in, in a couple of months to continue talking and continue developing your relationship. And it may take, right, you know, you know, a number of visits before your primary care provider and you feel like jointly you understand each other, you know, he or she understands your medical problems and then you can move forward. So, um, so that's my only word of advice for primary care. Can I Let me add one more. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to kind of tie together what Susie said and what the doctor has just said from a physician's perspective. Yes, we have to be as well prepared as we can with information when we go in, information about our health history and information about um, anatomy and physiology to ask the right questions. And given what the duress that doctors are under now, especially since the age of COVID, all clinics and hospitals I go to are desperately understaffed. They don't have enough medical assistants anymore or nurses. Every one of my doctors is carrying twice the load that they did prior to COVID. Be merciful to your physician, especially if you think they may turn out to be the one for you. Good advice. Good advice. That's really good. That's really nice advice. I was going to acknowledge something along the same lines, which is that from the NCI perspective, the burden should not be on the survivor to navigate all of this. And that is one of the reasons we have the standards. We had a funding opportunity on primary care, cancer survivorship research, because ultimately the answer really should not be that the survivor is informed and prepared to make sure they're getting good care. Ultimately, the answer should be in the hands of the organization and the providers who are working there. And we should not be putting more burden on survivors to make sure that they are receiving high quality care, that the burden really needs to be on the organization and the providers and the health system. But I, I hope we, we learn how to be prepared until our physicians do take on that responsibility. Right, right. So yes. that's why Nicely. I think we really are. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, this is great. We're a little over halfway through, so we have a lot of questions. Uh, the first one actually isn't a question, it's more of a plea. And the topic is disability. Mm -hmm. um, and the plea is that we need help establishing need and support that late effects easily are a full-time job and in this survivor's case, it's been under medical review for over a year. Wow. So I'm kind of looking at Larissa, but others. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, this is a, um, a, a critical topic and concern. I mean, so an organization that I would refer um, you to is, is Triage Cancer. Um, it's a, um, a fantastic organization that basically works on this issue, works on work, employment, and cancer and cancer survivorship. Um, I was recently on a committee that was at the National Academies of, of Medicine, and it was, um, it was a committee that was put together on behalf of um, the Social Security Disability, SSDI, um, and what they were specifically tasking the committee was help us understand cancer. <laughs> and help us understand the effects of cancer long term. Because you know, once you have cancer, you can apply for disability, right? That, that's your sort of your automatic, you can, def, you can do that. But what they sort of don't really understand and didn't understand is that 10, 20, 30, 40 years after cancer, when you don't have active cancer, um, what are the, implications on functional status and functional impairments. And so what we try to demonstrate to them is that, you know, typically if let's say you have congestive heart failure and it's very, you know, it's terrible, like you've got a low ejection fraction, it's really bad, you have a, sort of all the notes from the cardiologist and you apply for disability based on congestive heart failure, that might go through. But what happens with late and long-term effects is that you may not have one system that is markedly affected to the extent that you can have disability, but you might have, this is a little bad, and 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 then together, it's really bad. And that's sort of a pathway that SSDI is not yet kind of a, not to, I mean, aware of or is prepared with. And so I don't know what's going to happen as a result of our report, you know, that we published. Um, but what I would recommend, and this is where patient voices and advocates can really help, is, you know, the way to get anything done in, in our country is, you know, you need to lobby and advocate. So, you know, speak to your local Congress people. You know, even speak to your state people to see what kinds of laws you can change in the state, what kind of laws you can change on a national level. So just be out there and, you know, raise your voices and share your stories because, you know, a lot of these congressmen and their staffers, you know, they're not aware, right? Like they're just not aware of the, the functional impairments that long-term Hodgkin survivors may have. But the more that they hear from you, and maybe this is something that Hodgkin International can work with NCCS with and other organizations is to advocate so that um, your voices are heard and policy is changed. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, that's certainly uh, the uh, area that NCCS has really taken on as one of their major uh, challenges. And when we first started NCCS in 1986, this these financial and work-related and insurance problems were all major, major problems that even came before some of the long-term and late effects. Mm -hmm. So we were discriminated against in a number of different mm -hmm. ways. So we've made a difference, I know, at NCCS, and they've got, and uh, Aaron and I are both on different committees, and uh, many of the other organizations also have their lobbying groups. So if you want to advocate at that level, there are lots of organizations now that help. But the whole thing is we need to start working together so that we have a much stronger voice uh, in order to, uh, to make these difficult uh, areas known. I just have to say, Cecilia, that we yeah. do actually, um, we obviously are very connected with NCCS. Yeah. I've been to several of the CPAT, uh, the uh, Full Action Committee uh, events in June, where we go up on the hill and tell our stories. And I know I've encouraged all of you to do the same. It's a wonderful experience, but I can tell you that sitting down in a room with your congressional representatives is a very powerful thing for you and for them. Just as uh, Larissa said, for them to hear our stories on a one-on-one, -on -one, you often get people who say, me too, or my father had cancer, or my mom has, is yeah. going through cancer. 
And those little conversations add up to change. And that is, you know, we keep saying what we want you to take away from today is what can you do? How can we move things forward? That is just one way. Great. Okay, I'm going to move us along now. Move. Okay. So the survivor writes, I had Hodgkin's in my late 20s. In my 40s, I started having problems, more issues with pain and physical sexual intimacy with my husband. This has been an ongoing problem into my 50s, and I'm wondering if this is a common problem for survivors, in other words, pain, unable to have sex due to pain. So I hear that a lot as a social worker, and I'm going to mm -hmm. turn it over to my clinician. Say. I can sure. take that. Go ahead. Wanna, yeah, you yeah. can take it. I've spoken enough. Okay. It is common. <laughs> it is common. It is common. And there are a number of reasons that something like that can happen, but it absolutely is common. And you should talk to your doctor. There really are therapies. There is actually, um, this is an uh, active area of scientific research, and there are therapies that you're eligible for, regardless of your um, cancer history and so um, yeah I would really just really encourage you to and if your provider's not listening to you or they're not asking you that question then you might need to find a different provider yeah and it could also be I mean kind of a multi I mean sexual health is multifactorial you know there's the psychological piece right there's the pain piece there may be vaginal dryness piece from early menopause and so it's really important to you know, talk to your doctor, but then also be referred to specialists, right? Like you may need to see a cardiologist when there's something major going on cardiac wise. And so this is a time that, um, you know, you may need to see a sexual health um, specialist who can kind of figure out what is the mechanism underlying your problem and then treat it appropriately. It's such a major issue with, with survivors of Hodgkin's because so many of us were really young when we were treated. So, you know, we can't even wait till we're 40 or 50 to have that kind of a problem yeah. because it starts earlier. Yeah. So that actually can be a conference unto itself. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good point. Okay, now for something a little different, a little existential here. Okay. How much does spirituality impact survivorship, if at all? Spirituality being self-defined, Thank you. I'll address that. Um, <clears throat> that's a big part of my experience right now. I've, I have found myself the last mm, five, five to seven years as I've begun really focusing in on the whole survivorship identity and whatnot that I'm, I, I don't think I'm alone in that we go through different seasons in our life, in our experience of what it means to be a, a survivor. Um, my cardiology team, when I developed cachexia about a year ago, which was involved rapid weight loss, and due to my heart failure, my organs were not getting enough oxygen, so they were beginning to consume muscle tissue just to keep me alive. They, they turned that around physically, but they immediately put me in touch with the palliative care team because they realized my, my prognosis was, was pretty serious at that point. Mm -hmm. And I have held on to her as a therapist. Um, it's been, I didn't even know what it was when I first met her, but it was the best decision that they've ever made to suggest her. And she is the one who's, as was mentioned in my, my introductory bio, has helped me to turn away just, uh, my thinking was just focused on deep grief over this ever increasing list of things that I could no longer do physically. And uh, it was dragging me down <clears throat> to the point of at least suicidal ideation, mm -hmm. if not, not active attempts. And um, I've continued to see her for most of the last year, about once a month, and she's helping me instead to think in terms of, um, uh, what's, what's the word I want? Values, character traits and values. What are what are the things that have always been important to me that I would like to develop more strongly? What, what do I want to be? Who do I want to be? And, and to work with the strengths and the, the uh, 
that were already within me, such as a sense of beauty, empathy, um, faith, mm. and whatnot. At the same time, or concurrently with this, um, I found myself through, it, you can connect with me one-on-one -on -one to hear more detail of the story, but um, after 40 years away from my church that I was born and raised in, the Catholic Church, I felt an overwhelming need to come home to that church. And so in the last year, not only have I done that, but I have felt drawn one step at a time deeper and deeper into involvement with a monastic community, a Benedictine monastery in Oregon. It's a couple hundred miles away from my home, but I'm going to uh, be taking on a role of an, an oblate, meaning uh, one who is uh, dedicated to the monastery, though not a, a vowed religious uh, person. So I'm going to uh, continue to develop that spiritual part of myself when I finally feel like between those two things, the input from the palliative care therapist from a secular perspective and the, the spiritual input from the monks that I'm communicating with at such depth, that that is finally answering my questions of where I am right now and where I see myself moving on. Uh, in the, the couple of years that I may have left to me. Um, uh, yeah, I've, yeah, I've come home. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. I want to go home. Aww. But, but uh, I'm excited about it, too. It's, uh, it's a good time. Thank you so much. It's deep. Spirituality is deep for, for those mm. of us that feel that. Um, I think just saying I'm tired is yeah. what makes me want to weep. I'm tired. We're all tired. Yeah. yeah. And I think not having spirituality, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I'm much of a spiritual person anymore, but I think not having something to believe in mm -hmm. um, it, is, is hard. It's hard, it's hard to face the, the exhaustion without having something. Mm -hmm. It's hard to keep from being afraid without having something. So whether it's the kind of work you're doing or um, just believing that you can get up tomorrow and get out of bed, uh, we have to have it. We have to have something. It's what I'm learning most of all from that monastic community is um, that I can help bring stability to the world in, in, in finding and being my best self. I, them and somehow uh, giving or lending stability to the people around me and their need because I'm becoming the best me that I can be and that's that's I'm getting closer and closer to my foundation and it's it's lending stability to my world around me that's where I want to be Nike mm -hmm. <laughs> I think spirituality means such a different thing to each one of us. It's, I think it's incredibly personal. And you don't have to be involved with a major religious community to feel spiritual. And I think a lot of us are really changing within ourselves uh, in our very, very own ways uh, to find the, the spirit in us. I could talk for an hour on this topic, but I'm going to keep us moving. Okay. Uh, this one is for Dr. Tanarizos. What is being done about contamination on military facilities? I got Hodgkin's while living on a contaminated base. My nephew got it in the Army in Afghanistan. What are the statistics for people with Hodgkin's or other cancers on military bases? Hmm. That's so, a tough one. Great, yeah, great question. Um, we know that lymphoma is, has a number of exposures that are related to um, people getting lymphoma. That area, it, that is an active area of research. In fact, the number of people being diagnosed with cancer and cancer at young ages is going up in this country. And, that is a huge problem that is being 
um, very actively address, not just at the National Cancer Institute, but also at um, the Institute for Environmental Health and other ICs within the National Institutes of Health. That problem, that is a problem of cancer etiology, so what are the causes of cancer. So that actually does not fall into the Office of Cancer Survivorship, although we do um, support that kind of research. What we focus on is um, what are the exposures that a person has at the time of diagnosis or afterwards that can contribute to side effects from treatment. So those are things like um, environmental exposures, diet, exercise, um, smoking, other things like that, but not in the etiology side. So I'm gonna tag team you here. Okay. Here's another question for okay. you. How <laughs> are long-term survivors tracked? How do you find them? Amazing question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so we know we, we don't have a lot of information on long-term survivors, and we know that's a gap in the portfolio. It's a gap that's been called out repeatedly. We um, are hoping over the next few years to bring some attention to that long-term survivor population um, in our research that we're supporting, but um, it's, a, it's a big problem. There are a few studies that have been going on for many years that include long-term cancer survivors. These are cohort studies that are funded by the National Cancer Institute. And there is actually one on lymphoma survivors called the LEO cohort. So there is a cohort, and there are others that include lymphoma survivors, but there is one that is dedicated to lymphoma survivors called the LEO cohort. So that is one way we keep track of cancer survivors. Great. I just wanted to add to that. So the National Academies of Medicine, um, if you basically Google NASEM, N-A-S-E-M, workshops, <laughs> Um, so a workshop um, that Emily mentioned that we held about multidisciplinary, um, multi-specialty medical care for cancer patients from diagnosis to survivorship was a program that um, we held last year. This July, we're holding a program about exactly this question, the tracking and the tumor registries um, and ways that we can enhance um, what we're currently doing with uh, tumor registries. And we have some speakers from international settings who are actually much more ahead of us in terms of tracking. Um, so in Europe, they're now kind of developing methods to track survivors and chronic medical conditions and late and long-term effects. We're nowhere close to that. Um, and so you can join the workshops that are held by NASEM, either in person, if you happen to be in Washington, DC, um, or virtually. They actually, even pre-pandemic, all of the workshops were streamed live. Um, so you can just register and join in, and you can ask questions um, you know, to the panel as a patient. And I think, again, here too, hearing voices of patients and survivors will be important to change policy going forward. Great. OK, I love this question. Um, and there's actually two questions kind of back to back. Why is our crowd here so white? And how can we include a more diverse population? What is the demographics of those with Hodgkin's? We have noticed it is mostly Caucasian women here. Is that reflective of the population? So uh, yes, it is reflective of the population. But white women are not the only people who get a Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, so I and, I, and I agree with the sentiment to um, try to be as inclusive as possible. I think what we acknowledge by the fact that um, it's mostly white people here in the room is that there are populations of people diagnosed with cancer who don't have access to the same type of care, including follow-up care. So that, yeah, that's, a, that's an important thing to acknowledge. And, but, and I just, uh, a short add-on. In my experience in uh, cancer survivorship focused groups, um, I see the same thing every time. It's never more than five or ten percent of the, the group or the room is men. It's mm. guys just don't look for things like this because it might be too emotive and it might be too touchy-feely. 
and I can do it all myself. Men just aren't looking for these kinds of venues or opportunities to share. That's, that's a big part of the reason that more of us aren't actually here. We're, we're out there. We're just not looking for things like this. So I would just add, as a social worker, I know I'm not part of the panel here. Yes, you are. But, <laughs> yes, you are. but as a social worker, let's be frank, a lot of our um, you know, underserved populations don't have the resources, the money, yeah. to travel here. Um, and maybe working two or three jobs and don't have the time to attend our webinars and mm -hmm. um, things like that or may not even have access to the internet. So I think my personal opinion as a country, and I know Tess, you're, you're over in Europe, but um, I think we need to do a better job. And I love the focus that NCI right now has on health disparities. I work in a school of nursing. There's a lot of focus within the National Institute of Nursing Research now to uh, include populations who are underserved, um, blacks, Hispanics, um, and survivors living in rural areas. Um, so I, I just want to be, I want us to be hopeful and that the organizations that are sponsoring our research are starting to put more and more money into these populations who are underserved. So I'm very optimistic about it. Anybody else want to comment? Um, when NCCS started in 86, one of our goals, we worked and strived so hard to increase uh, the diversity within our group. and. Men, oh my gosh, it was so hard to get <laughs> men involved. Uh, but what really helped, I think, with the men was a, a, a fellow uh, raised his hand one time and when, when I was doing one of my talks, and he said, how come all the breast cancer survivors get everything and we men with prostate cancer have nothing? I said, because they're doing it. You've got to get out there and do it yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, we can't do it with them. So once the men started getting together and forming their own groups and organizations, <laughs> that increased a lot of their mm -hmm. uh, participation. But it's taken almost 40 years for NCCS now to have a wonderful group of, of uh, women and men who are from the uh, Hispanic communities, the, the uh, black communities. We've got lots of uh, diversity, but it's taken a long, long time. Yep. We just have to work at it. <clears throat> Yeah, I have to say, as a researcher, I really struggled to recruit men into my intervention <laughs> trials. I mean, we get some, but yeah, yeah. Um, women are much more likely to participate in uh, psychosocial But I think it, it, it has to, we can't stop with that, though. We've certainly noticed that in our group, in our Zoom meetings, and yeah. who's online. It tends to be white women. And I, and I think we have to stop saying, um, okay, that is what it is, baby, you know. Yeah. But we have to say why and go after them. It's like yeah. going after people who don't know they're at risk. We can't sit around and wait for them to exactly. find out. We gotta go after them. Where are you? Yeah. And why aren't you here? And what can we right. do to get you here? Right. And that's exactly what I love that NCI and NINR mm -hmm. are putting the money behind that and the Agreed. funding. Agreed. Uh, to include them in clinical trials, et cetera. Okay, I think we got time for one more question, and I'm looking over here. <laughs> so what do you think about EMFs, electromagnetic frequency? Are former recipients of radiation more sensitive to EMFs? This this actually, is this the same person who asked the etiology question? Because, I don't think okay. so. Um, the, the handwriting is different, <laughs> so these are really hard questions. <laughs> I don't think um, so. So, at, at, so interesting. So if this is a fantastic question. This is actually un, unanswerable with the current state of the science. We don't know the answer. Um, 
probably, you know, there are exposures that seem to affect cancer survivors more than they affect other people. Um, but whether this is one of them, I don't, I don't, that's not an answered question. Yeah. Anybody else know anything? Anybody nope. in the room know anything? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> like high power lines and yeah, you know, oh, yeah. Kevin, the magnet, the magnetic anything? frequencies that are produced by electricity moving. No. <laughs> what? What? Kevin has an answer. No. Yeah, oh. I asked him too. From the etiology oh. standpoint, it's still not been shown to be causative, but we don't know if it is in other populations that might be at risk, such as cancer survivors. Can I can just say one thing yes. about that because. I think that's a burning question for many of us. We may never get an answer to why. Mm -hmm. And we are going to have to, we have been living with right. that. Right. And we are going to have to live with that. You know, I didn't smoke cigarettes when I was 10. You know, I, I can't tell you, I can't tell you now how I got Hodgkin's. I may never have the answer to that. You all may never have an answer to that. So I think the need for, you know, understanding and, and having answers is so great that sometimes we try to grasp, I'm not saying that this is grasping at straws, but I think it's a pretty normal human reaction to not knowing why. Yeah. And I think we all struggle with that. We're yeah. never probably going to get an answer. Um, Fabulous. I love that. That's yeah. our closing comment. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I would like to leave with you is um, I had written an article a while back called From Voiceless to Vocal. And I've got to tell you, we survivors have got to continue to tell our stories. Mm -hmm. And when, after Aaron told the most amazing, gave the most amazing presentation I think I've ever heard mm -hmm. from a survivor, oh. that has made, that will make such an impact and it can go further than a lot of other things. So we, we have to continue to tell our stories because that then gives information to our researchers mm -hmm. as to the next area that needs to be researched. Exactly. So we've all got to really find our voices in some way. And it doesn't have to be on a major stage. It just has to be in a little, uh, you know, talking to your local newspaper or TV station. Uh, talking to other survivors, but know that you have a very powerful voice to make a difference. Yeah, thank you. Amen. So we're out of time. I just want to apologize to those who submitted questions. We didn't get to them. So if you have a burning question, please approach our panel, perhaps at break, over lunch, et cetera. And I want to give a huge thank you to our panel, our amazing panel. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs>